This is Toby Capwell, historian, author, and expert on medieval and renaissance arms and armor. Today on this episode brought to you by Warhaven, he is sharing his thoughts and breaking down some of the game's armor and designs. Gotta pop out Leonardo Glider. I wouldn't have thought of him as a glider pilot. <laughs> Warhaven is free to play and out now. So be sure to check it out for yourself on Steam and let us know in the comments your favorite classes or sets. But without further ado, it's over to Toby. I really like that. I don't know how representative that is of what actually happens when you're playing the game, but just the fact that they showed the armor doing something useful like turning an arrow, you really don't see that very much. Oh, look, there's another person got hit by an arrow, not defended so successfully, but it doesn't stop them that much. That's kind of neat to see. I just think it's important to say that we will judge a game on the merits of what it is trying to do. If it's not trying to be historical, if it's not trying to be consistent geographically or temporally, then there's no point in criticizing them for that. It seems to me with this introductory sequence, they're reserving the right to take anything from any historical period they like and combine it with anything else they like, whether it's from a different part of the world or a different time period or whatever. In this game, they're being very clear about the freedoms they're giving themselves. And they're really pulling out all the stops to try and find an original look and an original feel to the environment. One thing I like about this introductory sequence, which I think carries on into the gameplay, more heavily armored characters are still moving dynamically and skillfully. They clearly don't feel like they have to show clunky, cumbersome, clumsy armored men. You, know, you can be wearing a lot of armor and still move dynamically and skillfully. And that's, uh, you know, that's appreciated. The one thing that here that I haven't seen before is the idea of combining a quite substantial modern military element. A modern audience can look at this and understand these people as hardened soldiers. You know, there's Kevlar body armor in there, ammo pouches and equipment and webbing combined with the historical elements in different ways. And that's going quite far out into the realm of we'll do anything in any order we like. Again, it's that really difficult task today of creating an original visual environment. But here with these guys, there's some nice stuff here like, they're emphasizing in the look of, of these sort of perhaps lower ranking uh, warriors, the padded textile armor. In the 14th century here in London, there was a company of what were called linen armorers. The armorers who made protective garments specifically out of padded textile. That's the, the cheapest, but also the most fundamental kind of armor that anybody would have. We get a better look here at some of the figures. On an imaginative level, it's kind of interesting. You could combine anything from any period in any place and put things together however you liked. Where would that take you? So this character, for head protection, is wearing a variety of Great Helm. The Great Helm is one of the most iconic of all knightly head defenses. They evolved towards the end of the 12th century, became ubiquitous in the 13th century, and survived into the 14th century before falling out of use later in the 1300s. This might not seem like a big deal to most people, but that's the one thing you probably would never wear with a great helm. A separate male collar is generally used with very different head protection for some very good reasons. The Great Helm formed because people had started with simple skull caps, but then as knights started to fight on horseback with the lance, they realizing that the face is a great target, helmets slowly started growing faceplates until you have this all-enclosing helm and all armor pieces are part of a system. The Great Helm works because of the rest of the system that it's worn with. But there are times where I'm gonna to need to take it off and fight without it, because I need to breathe, I need to see more. And if you accept that there are times when you need to uncover your face, and the only way you can do that is to take the helm off, you need more protection underneath. And this is the problem with, com sometimes you run into, you combine elements from different periods, but then you end up in places where they wouldn't actually work, because now he can never take that helmet off. 
because he's just wearing a male collar. When in reality, you would wear a com at least a complete male hood. And often with great helms like this, they've got a steel skull cap underneath the helm as well. So they're actually wearing two helmets, one underneath the other because the outer one has to be able to come off. Then some clever clogs at the very end of the 13th century or early 14th century said, hey, this is getting a bit complicated. Why don't we just hinge the front of the helmet so you can just pop it open? Oh uh, yeah. Once you can do that, you don't need to take the skull off. You don't need all that stuff underneath and then you can just wear a male collar, fine. So this is an interesting example of that. It, it moves us to think about the realities of how armor works as part of a system, not just bits put together however you like. From a historical point of view, it's very odd to see overall what seems like 16th century armor combined with a helmet dating from 300 years earlier. I'm not citing it as a problem or a criticism for this particular game because this game is very clear about its aesthetic. But this, even then, this still is very revealing about what people feel is expressive of a warrior of that class from that part of the world. There's something about the Great Helm that's so distinctive of you know, the most essential concepts of knighthood and chivalry in Europe. This is actually another nice detail here where the, we see medieval knights alongside artillery and gunpowder weapons. Knights in armor coexisted with gunpowder weapons for well over 200 years. And the knights themselves were perfectly happy to use them themselves. Stereotype is that gunpowder weapons are the kind of diametric opposite of medieval knights. But in reality, knights loved gunpowder weapons and learned to use them very rapidly. And he's got an MP40 submachine gun magazine pouch from the German Army of the Second World War on his right side there. He's also got this pretty nicely rendered lion head that's probably sculpted in somewhat higher relief than you would have a lion head in reality, maybe. But that's, that's very expressive of the Renaissance, especially the Italian Renaissance in Europe. In the 16th century, when they'd really mastered the, the high relief sculpting of steel and iron. Lion-headed armor like that became, you know, you know, very much evocative of the age. That shows on the one hand what they've been looking at in their design process and also how they really are pulling out all the stops to do absolutely as they please. <laughs> we ride the winds of war. Dark beneath my They've actually done a really nice job here of just modeling and animating the action of the horse, evoking the threat that an armored cavalryman could really pose, that he can move fast and, and has huge mobility, and the rider is someone who's been training with weapons since he was a child. Obviously, this is a fantasy combining European medieval and ancient Egyptian elements in this case, but horses of any description and the action of their movements is, remains one of the most challenging artistic problems. He actually picked up one of his enemies on the spear. The game developers might not be aware of it, but in the 16th century epic poem, Orlando Furioso, the knightly heroes in that in that poem are, are superheroes, essentially. And in, in one combat sequence, this is emphasized by the horseman picking up several enemies on the ground, all kind of shish kebabbing onto his lance to emphasize, again, the prowess of the character. It's kind of funny that they picked up on that, so to speak. <laughs> the action of the horse is really nice, the way it turns and slides and things. I mean, that, that's expressive of quite high level equitation. Got to pop out Leonardo Glider, the bulkiest and heaviest character in the game. I wouldn't have thought of him as a glider pilot. <laughs> but, but that's the nice thing about a video game. You can make anything work, right? This character is a, another generally late medieval figure. It is kind of overall impression big, heavily muscled, physically imposing character. So that's what's being emphasized in the aesthetic. Big shield, big forearm plates, big pouches, big everything. Again, I, I think sometimes you can have big characters without needing to make the joints outsized and things. And even 
you know, really big characters can have a gracefulness to them. The helmet is a sallet worn with a bever. It's a typical 15th century combined with this Gulf Wars scarf and big array of pouches. I guess he has to keep his Leonardo glider somewhere. I like seeing the big shield. The shield is so big that he, you know, he could probably afford to take some of that plate armor off behind it if he needed to. Clearly the, the system of design for the whole game, the combination of certain historical flavors and references combined with very contemporary features. So this is nice to see, again, a knightly figure in, in full plate armor just fighting with a spear. It's easy to forget about spears. You know, knights are so often armed with big swords or axes, but Historically, one of always one of the most important knightly weapons was just the the plain old spear. By the time I'm done here, everyone will know my name. This one is much more kind of pure imagination. I mean, there's a she's got an Ottoman sword. You know, a lightly armored person like that is fighting a heavily armored person like that other guy. The fatigue is the key element in the whole thing. I mean, in reality, that's a key concern there. And probably the, one of the only ways a person like that could possibly defeat a person like those heavily armored opponents is just play it safe until they're really tired. <laughs> I can see how a character like that would be fun to play because you have much more of a capacity to be using unarmed martial arts techniques alongside the edged weapon. You know, the jumping about on a character like that is, makes a lot more sense than, I won't say a fully armored man can't jump about a bit, but he probably won't make a habit of it. <laughs> I come to you through flame. From ash, a new world rises. Here they're, they are playing with the use of plain polished surfaces, which is nice to see. There's some decoration at the edges, but the shininess and reflective quality of the armor is the key element in the, in the visual effect, which is, which is cool to see. There's a couple of kind of interesting references from my point of view as an art historian here. The image of a heavily armored woman is a reoccurring image in European art. It did happen. I mean, the most obvious case, of course, is Joan of Arc, who really did wear plate armor and go on campaign with the French army in the 15th century. But also in, in art, various Greco-Roman goddesses are routinely shown in armor. The imagery that's being used in this character and the way it's rendered is actually very Baroque. It really reminds me of the, the late 17th and early 18th century. I don't know if, if that's something that designers were aware of at all, but some of the motifs and the, the kind of artistic techniques they've used to render them really remind me of the kind of more modern retrospective view of the chivalric society of the Middle Ages. Putting all that flowing cloth in there to kind of accentuate and elaborate her movements is quite an interesting idea too. And, and flowing cloth garments of various kinds is an important part of knightly equipment. Knights sometimes did wear long flowing sleeves kind of like that, just to elaborate the image and kind of radiate power and give a sense that the knight was the wielder of kind of divine or elemental forces. Sometimes rich cloth too could be as expensive if not more expensive than the armor itself. 15th or 16th centuries was fast, fantastically expensive. You know, flowing cloth can look like clouds, it can look like fire, smoke. In reality, all kinds of fascinating things you can do with cloth on a body in motion, especially, you know, a fighting body or, or an equestrian figure. <laughs> This character gives a, a pretty ready impression as a, a chemist or an apothecary with the you know, bottles of potions at her belt. And it's kind of interesting with this character actually that it's a, it's a medic or a healer with potions and she's also a warrior character. And this, this is very reminiscent of the, the military orders of the crusading period most obviously the Hospitallers, uh, later called the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. They began as a religious order who were tasked with taking care of pilgrims 
trying to get from Western Europe to the Holy Land. But very rapidly in that period, you can't offer protection and just be medics. And the Hospitallers rapidly be became a military order of knights, becoming the Knights Hospitaller, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. And today, St. John's Ambulance is one of a number of derivations of that military order. We don't have time for regret. This is gonna hurt. No! So here we have another, broadly speaking, late medieval armored knight type character, but this seems like a good point to talk about the pouches. We mentioned a bit earlier, again, we see what look a lot like triple MP40 magazine pouches. None of these characters who are wearing ammo pouches have need of the ammunition. None of them are armed with modern firearms. That's not what they're doing here. It goes back at least to 1977 with the uh, uh, original Star Wars. In the original Star Wars film, they had this space opera, but they also wanted the world to seem lived in and practical and plausible from a physical point of view. There must be a Star Wars influence in, in this design aesthetic. Whoever came up with the idea of putting 20th century ammo pouches on a medieval knight has to have been thinking about Star Wars. I can't think of any other possible source of inspiration for this. If one of their underlying principles in the game is to really get a sense of these characters as hardened fighting people and warriors and soldiers, as just warriors and soldiers at the same time, if you see what I mean by that distinction. They're manifesting that in visual terms that they think you know their audience will respond to. It's like a fashion designer using camouflage. I think, again, we have to take it as a, as a visual effect and not expect any more of it, really. They're pulling things from so many different places. The concern would be that it does, none of the characters look like they belong together or exist in the same world. But the use of the pouches and rolls and camping gear kind of has an interesting unifying effect visually. It's quite a tricky balancing act, actually. You know, there's part of me that thinks if you're wearing MP40 pouches, you should have an MP40. I'm sure a medieval knight would have loved submachine guns if they'd had them or found out about them. There's a vague sense with this character too that it's a late medieval or renaissance type character pretending to be Roman. Her besagues, the, the discs she's wearing at her, at her shoulders, very strong design that can't crumple or collapse very easily. You know, I like figures like this because again, I always enjoy it when I see grace and elegance in a fully armored body. For so long, the clunky, cumbersome, over heavy, fall down and you can't get up kind of aesthetic has been, you know, overemphasized. And it's nice to see that designers now are, are seeing the beauty and grace that an armored body can have. And you can run. You can run perfectly well in full plate armor. It's not, again, it's nice to see them uh, showing that. Ha, I'm gonna be immortal! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> again, all of these figures have a combination of different elements from different parts of the world and, and varying historical periods, a piece of armor can be really distinctive and recognizable at the same time as being pretty simple. The gauntlets are especially nicely made on this figure. Plate armor for the hands and forearms is one thing that often confounds digital artists. They find they want the hands to be able to move into positions that you can't move when you've got a gauntlet like that on. The gauntlets specifically on that figure are, are really nice looking. When he raises the warhammer, his whole shoulder plate has to raise up. A big pauldron like that has an articulation at the top, which accounts for some of the upper movement of the shoulder, sooner or later the whole body of the thing has to travel. They captured that quite nicely, as well as the dynamics of the momentum of a, of a big weapon like that carrying the body around and, and so forth. The Shut down. This one for me is interesting just again to see what aspects of historical human arms and armor have made an impression on the game developers why they've taken specific elements to create, you know, the 
the visual environment that they're after. In a game, you can make anything work the way you want it, and there's a kind of a disconnect between the way something works and feels and behaves and what it looks like. Sometimes you want those things to work together, sometimes you don't. For me, this is an interesting one to ponder and think about, try and get my head around more of the issues having to do with a game as an interactive work of art and something that's trying to create a mood, it's trying to create a tangible environment. It's that quest for the original. And I think they've had some interesting impulses and gone in some interesting directions in the quest for that. I'd be very interested to find out what happens next with this. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to check out Warhaven on Steam and comment below for what other games you'd like to see on the show. And of course, be sure to subscribe for more content like this and beyond.